All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Mike in New Haven podcast. This is episode 94. If you haven't checked out episode uh, 93, uh, 93, this interview is being recorded on a Tuesday. It'll be airing on a Thursday. So by the time you hear this, you'll have seen episode 93. It was featuring uh, retired NYPD Lieutenant Ron Rose, who worked in the El Dorado Task Force for a while, 1992 to 2001. A lot of interesting cases he worked, taking down drug dealers, taking down the mob. So interesting to hear his perspective on how everything works in the anti-money laundering. Uh, division. And so he was a great guest and a very good guy to talk to. And in this episode, episode 94, is a continuation of really one of my favorite projects that I've undertaken in my time doing this podcast. And that is Tales from the Boom Room, another volume, volume 11, uh, profiles of the NYPD's arson, explosion, and bomb squad. We've had so many great guys from A&E and the bomb squad come on. Uh, one guest twice. And today, the next guest I'm about to introduce, of course, is... Um, coming on for the second time. And this is part of a little project I've undertaken within Tales from the Boom Room and focusing on the case of the 1996 crash of TWA Flight 800. So it's an investigation that still leaves a lot of questions 25 years later. The anniversary just passed. The plane went down the night of July 17th, 1996, killing all on board. So when you had, uh, you had many agencies investigating this case, among them the NYPD's bomb squad, you had Don Sadawi come on this show for what was a two-part special and give his thoughts on the case. And now you get another returning guest who was an NYPD bomb squad detective at the time, was also assigned to the OSI, uh, the Office of Special, Special Investigations for United States Air Force. Coming back is Detective Dan McNally. Welcome back, Dan. Good to have you. Uh, thanks for having me, Mike. No problem. So we'll start with the night itself first. The plane went down, I have in front of me here. It took off, of course, from, excuse me for just a moment, John F. Kennedy Airport. It had flown earlier in the day. That wasn't its only flight. It had gone out to Greece, and then it was on its way back to America for what was going to be a little bit of a, of a gathering process for all the passengers, and then it was going to head back out to Europe. Uh, and then, of course, it breaks up about 12 minutes after takeoff. So the night itself, July 17th, 1996, where were you when you first heard? Well, I was actually on military leave. I went on military leave on uh, July 15th with uh, the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. And uh, uh, I referred back to my memo books uh, from the bomb squad, uh, the NYPD bomb squad, to see where I was and how deep my uh, participation was in this investigation. Uh, uh, I was well aware of the incident while I was on active duty uh, because I was working in New York City. I was working in our offices uh, down at 26 Federal Plaza. And uh, one of the things that I did initially um, was to reach out to detective friends of mine and try to get information and gather information for the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. It was as if uh, we would conduct an, uh, an investigation so I could write a report to OSI as to what happened that night. Uh, so I was, I was involved in the investigation on a peripheral uh, uh, while I was on active duty with the Air Force. Okay, so this is, and I, and I talked about this with Don when he was not discussing it. At the time that this happened, uh, this is eight years after the explosion of Lockerbie, that flight in Scotland. This is right. three years after the World Trade Center bombing, the first attack on the Trade Center in 1993. This is a year after the Oklahoma City bombing, bombing of 1995. So when you hear a plane going down over the water, uh, given all the events that have happened in the last uh, less than a decade, close to a decade, though, with eight years starting with Lockerbie, did your initial thoughts go to terrorism? Well, Again, uh, I was reviewing, it was uh, eight, around 8.15 in the evening when the news agency started to report that a plane went down off of uh, Mauritius, Long Island. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the NYPD, the family members of the victims of this incident started arriving at JFK airport uh, shortly after the news article started going on TV. Anybody in the tri-state area who had loved ones on that aircraft started arriving over at JFK. Uh, <clears throat> one of my friends, a detective uh, with the Deputy Commissioner of Public Information for the NYPD, was directed to respond to JFK 
to assist in information gathering and to comfort the uh, family members of the victims. And uh, I think around 10 p.m. of the night of the incident, uh, James Kallstrom arrives over at JFK. Now he either arrived at JFK or the Ramada Hotel located next to JFK because I think they moved the uh, the uh, victim's families over to the Ramada. But I, I'm not sure if it was in JFK or over at the Ramada. But uh, my friend who was at the location at that time said, James Kallstrom came in and he was fairly convinced at that time that it was a missile fired from a Grady White type of uh, boat. Uh, and that, uh, that was his initial. So that, that's what I was going on uh, based off of, you know, by, by the uh, morning of the 18th, I was looking at missiles. Okay. So we're coming at a point here and we're talking with Dan McNally here in the Mike David podcast. This is volume 11 of Tales from the Boom Room Profiles of the NYPD's Arson Explosion of Bomb Squad to where the response is massive because this is, you're not the only agency involved. Of course, there's other bomb squads involved, Nassau County's bomb squad, Suffolk County's bomb squad, the FBI, the CIA even gets involved. So we'll talk about that a little later though. So as far as coordinating the response, and we'll dive into the meat and potatoes investigation in a moment, uh, as far as coordinating the response and who would take charge, how quickly was that disseminated amongst you guys? Again, this was a, this was a big incident and uh, it involved an aircraft. So normally the FAA is involved and the NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board is involved. And the NTSB is responsible for conducting airplane crash investigations. Uh, had this been a military aircraft, uh, the Air Force Office of Accident Investigations would have conducted the investigation. As far as I know, the Air Force Accident Investigation Bureau was not involved in this investigation at all. However, they did monitor and track it uh, because of uh, anything that deals with aviation and you know, the Air Force is aviation. Um, I would like to commend at this point, the people who responded that night, uh, the, uh, the Coast Guard out of Mauritius, the uh, Air National Guard out of uh, Gdansk Airport out in uh, Suffolk County, uh, the uh, 106th Air Sea Rescue Unit, uh, the various fire departments and, and uh, county officials who responded to the crash site in the attempt to uh, save lives. It was a, uh, it was a, uh, you know, very brave. And, uh, and the uh, FDNY sent out their fire boats out there to help with the, uh, the rescue operations. The NYPD sent out their launches uh, from uh, their uh, Harbor Patrol to help and assist in any way possible. And uh, there was a real volunteer coordinated effort to try to rescue any of the survivors had there been any. And that, that, that should really uh, you know, be known by the public that uh, the, the, the good people of New York and Long Island uh, rushed to the rescue of their fellow citizens. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, the uh, bomb squad, uh, it was not our jurisdiction. It's outside the city limits. So we were invited into the investigation uh, by uh, the powers that be at that time. And uh, I'm not sure who was calling the shots at that time, whether it was the NTSB or the FBI. I was pretty sure just because of the size of the footprint of the FBI in New York City, that early in this investigation, they were calling the shots because they, they believed it was a terrorist incident. Absolutely. Uh, quick pause here in the Mike Naven podcast. We'll be right back. Thank you. So the FBI, we're back here in the Mike Naven podcast talking with Dan McNally, retired NYPD bomb squad detective, and of course, uh, OSI agent at the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. Uh, the FBI brings you guys in, of course, and uh, this is a major uh, effort to coordinate. It's clear early on, unfortunately, there's not going to be uh, many survivors uh, because of the, the just the catastrophic nature of the explosion, the altitude that they were at. I have in front of me the uh, official report, well, not the official report, I should say, but just a general synopsis of Wikipedia. 
uh, in the last two paragraphs here, I'll read just for the audience for, for provide context. TWA Flight 800 then received a series of heading changes and generally increased altitude assignments as it climbed to its intended cruising altitude. Rather, in the area was light uh, weather in the area, I should say, excuse me, was light winds with scattered clouds and there were dusk lighting conditions. The last radio transmission from the airplane occurred at 8.30 p.m. when the flight crew received and then acknowledged instructions from Boston Center to climb to 15,000 feet. The last recorded radar transponder return when the airplane was recorded by the FAA radar site in Pennsylvania at 8.31, 12, uh, 831, uh, 12 seconds p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 38 seconds later. The captain of an East Wing Airlines Boeing 737 reported to the Boston Center that he, quote unquote, just saw an explosion out here, adding, quote, we just saw an explosion up ahead of us here, about 16,000 feet or something like that. It just went down into the water, end quote. Subsequently, many air traffic facilities in the New York Long Island area received reports of an explosion from other pilots operating in the area. Many witnesses in the vicinity of the crash stated they saw or heard explosions accompanied by a large fireball or fireballs over the ocean and observed debris, some of which was burning while falling into the water. So you're operating on the missile theory. There are many, many people who were interviewed about that, hundreds as a matter of fact. All of them said the same thing. None of them knew each other prior. And before you dive deep into it, because this is a really um, interesting aspect in the investigation, I do want to say a couple of things. One, for my listeners, we're not doing a conspiracy theory thing. This is just a facet in the investigation. Dan's not like that, and I'm not like that either. So we're not trying to go down a crazy rabbit hole here. We're just giving you a different side of the investigation. The other thing is, um, for context, and I noted this in my special with Don, uh, TWA Flight 800, at the time it went down, was flying near a military base that sometimes would do trainings. They would do certain drills involving uh, firing missiles into the air, not recklessly, but just preparing the men in the event that they were facing a situation like that, they would know what to do. Rather, that was going on that night, we don't know, but Dan's going to give us a better clip. Dan, take it away. Well, there is a training area in the Atlantic Ocean in the north and off of the coast of Long Island. It's a, it's a box uh, uh, that is designated. And it's where uh, uh, Grumman used to conduct their, uh, their test of like the uh, Tomcats and, uh, you know, aircraft and stuff like that. Uh, there is no like really big military base on Long Island, except for the, the 106 uh, Air Sea Rescue Unit and uh, a couple of aviation assets of the New York Army National Guard. Uh, I, I'm not aware of any like naval installations on Long Island, uh, but there is a training area that is off the coast of Long Island. It's about, I, I don't know how far out it is, but it, it's not close to where uh, uh, the TWA Flight 800 plane went down. I don't believe it is. Uh, but, uh, you know, you mentioned the, uh, the interviews of eyewitnesses. Uh, I could share this with you. I did speak to FBI agents during the course of this investigation. And uh, I said, you know, there's always people who say, oh, you can't trust an eyewitness. You really can't trust an eyewitness. I don't agree with that. I believe you, you can. And what they did was they interviewed about 700 people up and down the coast of Long Island who said that they saw something. And the FBI ruled out a lot of the people uh, because they might have been on a boat and they didn't know their orientation or they could have, uh, they, they were confused as to where they were standing that day or there was drinking involved, right? But there was a lot of people like, you know, 200 that you cannot rule out. And of them, there was a cadre of people, of witnesses who were adamant and who were trained observers. And one of them was uh, Fred Myers. Uh, he was in an aircraft uh, and he saw what he believed to be missiles striking TWA Flight 800. And he was a, you know, a New York Air National Guard pilot, trained observer. He fought in World War II. I mean, he fought in Vietnam and he saw missiles come up at, at him at that time in, in Vietnam. So he knows exactly what military ordinance looks like. His testimony, I have witnessed his te testimony over the past 25 years regarding this incident. And I believe him, you know, I, 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 he has nothing to gain by fabricating what he believed he saw. Uh, and he has everything to lose because he brought up the, uh, the concept of conspiracy and, and uh, you know, I think, I think 
uh, Major Myers, uh, his reputation suffered because of his, his, uh, his testimony. Uh, having said that, uh, I did talk to the FBI about this uh, investigation and the interview of the witnesses. And what they did was they, uh, they plotted the location of each uh, interviewee, each witness. They plotted them on a map uh, of Long Island and they were you know, separated by tens of miles. And then they would ask the witness, could you point in the direction of where you believe you saw this incident? And they would point in a specific direction. And what they did was they shot an azimuth, uh, uh, an angle, an azimuth uh, off a compass towards the location where all these uh, witnesses believed that they saw, and saw something come out of the water. And they all triangulated a, in the same general location. So when you have people, so many people say that they saw something and the distance from each person could be up to 10 miles, maybe more, uh, but yet when you put them at the location where they thought, where they believed that they witnessed this incident, and then you have them point in the direction and then you shoot these azimuths and they all converge in one location, you know, I, I think that that is pretty solid proof that the witnesses saw something. And uh, I, I, I can't disregard that, you know. Absolutely. And that, you know, we'll move ahead for a moment. Then we'll come back to 1996 because April of 2000, um, four months before the final report came out from the National Transportation Safety Board, they did uh, a missile. They d dove deep into the missile uh, theory uh, at an Air Force base in which they conducted tests and they had eyewitnesses. And they came to the conclusion that if they did see a missile, they would have observed this, that and the other which effectively in, in their eyes ruled out that theory as being a possibility. I don't know if you're aware of those tests being conducted. I, I, saw, that, I saw that report, I saw the actual report. And what they said was that uh, the witnesses did see the missiles. They, they shot up, I think, three to four missiles, uh, type of man pad missiles, uh, mm -hmm. like a stinger. And they had uh, uh, witnesses positioned at different locations. And they says, okay, uh, you know, can you see it at this distance? And uh, the witnesses said that they could see, it. but the uh, they spun that report saying that uh, you know uh, witnesses really couldn't see a missile. And uh, so I actually read the report, that report, and it says yeah, you know, fourteen out of seventeen witnesses said that they saw it and they were able to describe it. So that that that's that's a pretty significant average, right? Um, so yeah, I saw that report. Uh, I, I, I think I think what the report actually says and what the media reported it to say are two different things. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to go any deeper than that. But. Yeah, we'll leave it there. We'll leave it there. But, you know, okay, so we're at this point here, and this is volume 11 of Tales from the Boom Room, profiles of the NYPD's arson explosion squad and bomb squad. Uh, returning guest Dan McNally, nice enough to take time out of his day to talk to me. Why, I don't know, but he's nice enough to be here <laughs> because I don't know how I get such great people on the show when I'm out to, to have them. Uh, but that being said, okay, so we push it back to 1996. There was a point, and this was described because you guys were in the hangar as this flight was being put back together, listening to the audio tapes over and over and over again. And what Don described here when he was on was that you guys, I don't know if you were in the hangar for this, I imagine you were. You, you listen to a, a tape of the black box, which was recovered, and they're talking, and then the audio cuts out a little bit. Then they're talking again, and the audio cuts out. They talk one more time, and this is just miscellaneous conversation, nothing related to anything going wrong, per se. And then it cuts out for what would be the final time, which is assuming when the explosion occurred. So just entertaining the idea that uh, it was the fuel tank that exploded and it was a hot night and that's what caused the plane to go down. How does the idea of, a, of something striking the aircraft versus the fuel tank theory line up with what I just described? Well, I didn't, I didn't listen to the black boxes. Uh, and it, the, the issue with the black boxes, as I understood them at that time, was that once the nose of the aircraft fell off to an effect called mock stem effect, uh, and, 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 and that's fairly well documented that the, the nose of the aircraft fell off. Once that happened, I, I, was, I was informed that the black boxes lost power. 
right? So that mm -hmm. they, they, they were not recording what they were supposed to be recording. And that, that has been something that has been rectified by the uh, placement of battery now in these black boxes. But I, from what I understand, the black boxes did not really give us a lot of information. I, I, I didn't, uh, there was an audio one and then there was a data one. And uh, when they recovered them, uh, I, I wasn't really familiar with that. Uh, I, I went out to Cableton and participated uh, in the examination of the aircraft as it came to Cableton for, explo for explosive evidence to see if there was metallurgical deformations that were uh, consistent with a high explosive event. Uh, why I was on active duty, I did a lot of research and I found a report out of Canada, Canadian Aviation Report, that was published in the 1970s of explosive uh, impact on aircraft metals. And it was a pretty comprehensive report with lots of photographs as to what it looks like and what I should be looking for. This was a copy of a copy of a copy that I found while I was on OSI. I presented it to the FBI and I asked them if they could get an original copy so that we could get better quality photographs of, uh, of uh, metal destroyed by high explosives on aircraft. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, I then made a, like a, uh, a handout, uh, eight and a half by 14 handout of the photographs that I did pull off of that particular report. And as I'm looking at the various components of the aircraft, I am comparing them to the report that I, that I had. And um, I did find uh, some uh, aircraft metal that I believe may have been consistent with a, a high explosive event. I presented them to the FBI. Uh, we did have at one time a microscope uh, available to us at the, on the floor of the Cableton uh, Grumman plant where we reassembled the plane. Not we, that was not my job. That was totally controlled by the NTSB. My job was as, the, as parts of the plane came in, I'm looking for high explosive incidents on that metal, on, on them components. Uh, I, I did 11 days, long days at a cabinet. Uh, I think in the first few, four, three, four days, five days that I was out there, and this is over a protracted period of time because the bomb squad was very busy at this time. Mm -hmm. Had this been a terrorist event, let me tell you something, the bomb squad went into high gear on security measures and protocols for the other airports, for LaGuardia, for JFK, and, and also for hotels and everything else going on in New York. And, and we were also gearing up for the uh, 51st anniversary of the uh, United Nations General Assembly, which was that September. And we, so we're gearing up for all that stuff too. So uh, it isn't as if the bomb squad could go out to Cavalton in its entirety and assist in this investigation. We sent out our people uh, out there to uh, do the best we could, uh, look for explosive evidence, and um, uh, you know. But the one point I do want to break uh, bring in is that you know I had a piece of evidence, and I wasn't allowed to take any photographs of anything. Uh, I did have a micrometer with me, and there was a lot of different agencies on the floor at Cal Calton. I can't go into them all, but the, one, one of the most interesting ones, of course, was uh, the metallurgists from Boeing Aircraft. Uh, they, they came out, and they're looking at, they're looking for metal fatigue, they're looking for everything. I mean, you had the uh, Mechanics Union out there, you had Airline Pilots Association, uh, you had NTSB, you had the FBI, you had ATF. And again, like ATF was relegated to, uh, you know, like that corner. They weren't allowed to participate. Um, uh, and after a while, ATF just packed up their stuff and, you know, left. Uh, the, um, I had what I thought was a perforation of a piece of metal. Uh, I measured it, I, I analyzed it, I took proper measurements, of, uh, but I couldn't take any photos. 
and I gave it to a uh, the uh, a professor of at Manhattan College School of Engineering up here in the Bronx, and he did an impact analysis, and he says, well, because of the type of metal, the thickness of the metal, and the size of the hole, uh, you know, something would be have you know something would have to be moving pretty damn fast uh, to to perforate that that metal. So I took that. I took them findings to uh, the uh, lead agent on the floor of, of Cavalton. And uh, the next thing that happened was uh, they removed the microscope and, um, and I never heard anything about it again. And that, that was a, a lot of bomb techs were out there. Um, if we brought something to the FBI's attention, it just disappeared. That's, that's my, that's what I believe that, you know, that, that, that's pretty much it. You know, it went into a special room where it was analyzed and then it went down to the FBI lab and then we never heard of it again. We never, it, there was, uh, uh, the FBI is very good at handling evidence. They never hardly ever lose evidence. And uh, uh, it, it, it was like an anomaly for us that, you know, certain things just, you brought it to their attention and then nothing was done about it. But, you know, again, you know, we were only there to assist. Um, yeah, so I spent a total of 11 days out there between, um, my first day out there was August 6th, and my last day out there was in uh, February of uh, the following year. It's 97. Yeah, yeah. I love how you had, I love how, I, this is this is the cool thing about it is that you get on the show such a, uh, and I hate to sound like a buff, but you get such a deep look into these investigations to where I love that the logs are there, you know, it's just because it's it's really, and this is, I'm saying this with all due respect to the victims, I'm not saying, oh, this is a, this is not a necessarily a happy topic we're talking about, but it's really a, a moment in time, it's really, you know, when you look through these, these old files, you look through these old logs, it's looking like a time, it's looking at a time capsule, and as someone like myself that loves history, um it's definitely really cool for me so i mean this is and we'll dive further into the meat and potatoes of the investigation in a moment but you know to see an investigation like this where so many lives are lost yeah you had experience i'm sure seeing people who had been who had been killed i mean you've been a cop by this point for 13 years you've been with the the military for 17 years by this point so i'm sure you had experience in seeing corpses but nonetheless it doesn't make it any easier especially the fact that children in this flight uh, were killed. So as far as the emotional toll of it, I mean, it, tell me about just that aspect of it for you personally. Well, there was a, uh, a small town in Pennsylvania and they had a, their high school had a French club. And uh, I think about 20 members of this high school French club was on that plane and it decimated that town. Um, this was a nice little town in Pennsylvania. And, they lost 20 of their children. Uh, we actually sent a contingent of guys from the bomb squad out there during the funeral services because uh, uh, working this crime scene uh, was, was very demanding. It was very hard. We're going through parts of the plane and we're finding bone fragments and stuff. And, you know, we're, we're, we're putting that aside. You know, we, we, we have to be cognizant of that. I mean, they did a pretty good job on the ships and before it came out over the Cavalton, but you're still finding, you know, things. And then they also laid out all the luggage. We, they, 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 the amount of investigative avenues that were taken during this investigation was mind boggling. They did background investigations on everybody on that plane to see if anybody was the target of an assassination. They went through every piece of luggage. They, they reconstructed the seating of the aircraft on the floor at Cavalton. The pictures that you see of the aircraft being reconstructed, that's only a small part of it, you know? Uh, the personal toll was that this was a big investigation. And if you couldn't take it in chunks and pieces, it was just overwhelming. And then the, uh, the emotional toll of the victims uh, it was horrible. None, none of these people deserved to die. Not, not one of them. And uh, 
That includes the airline pilots and the uh, and the flight crews. They were, you know, everybody looked at the flight crews, the airline pilots, pilot, you know, pilot uh, accident or something. And I can honestly say that I don't believe any of the people at TWA, whether it was the pilots or the flight crews or the ground crews or the uh, uh, people at JFK, uh, the air traffic controllers, uh, had anything to do with this incident. Uh, they were all performing their duties uh, exceptionally well. Uh, and uh, uh, so when you, when you see all of that, and you're saying, wow, we got so many victims, you know, 230 victims, that's a lot of people. The first night we recovered 140 bodies and they set up a temporary morgue in the riches. And uh, at some point in time, a friend of mine, Mike Stapleton, who had a security firm here in New York, he moved one of his x-ray machines for scanning luggage out to Cabelton so that they could, uh, at, at one point in time, they had uh, body remains in a uh, reefer out of Cabelton, uh, uh, like a trailer, truck trailer that had refrigeration on it. And one of the jobs, uh, a uh, member of the bomb squad had to do was x-ray body parts for uh, bomb components. And uh, Pete Dalton took that job on uh, and God bless him for doing it. Yeah. You know, uh, it was, it took an emotional toll on him, you know, uh, running victims to uh, an x-ray machine for, uh, for evidence. And, uh, and then that, 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 that picked up, uh, that that got more finalized. That type of uh, investigation got more finalized a little bit later. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, of course, it's emotional. You don't want to see people die, you know. Uh, of course. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, you know, one of the things I do want to uh, bring up is the uh, the Air Force perspective on this. And again, I was on active duty for the first two weeks of this investigation. And while on active duty, you know, we were looking at Stinger missiles. We're looking at uh, what we left in Afghanistan, uh, what the Soviets have in the SA-18s, 14s, and 12s, uh, the, uh, and their capabilities. And we're trying to do a threat assessment for Air Force uh, assets around the world. And... Uh, when they came out and says, well, you know, a Stinger missile wouldn't be capable of bringing down a 747, uh, I have to contest that. I, I have to say, no, I, no, I think it can. And uh, uh, so the, uh, the possibility of a Stinger missile hitting that aircraft and bringing it down, it's a strong possibility. Uh, the other thing I want to bring in is that we try to eliminate a, different, a bunch of different things. And one of them was uh, a bomb in the, in the luggage hold. And uh, Sergeant Mark Torrey of the bomb squad, uh, I was with him on this particular day. We went through the luggage containers, the uh, cargo containers, every one of them that was available over at uh, Cavalton for explosive damage. And we couldn't see or find any evidence of a bomb going off in the uh, luggage containers. All right. Uh, the other thing that uh, you brought up Lockerbie. And so this was a uh, part of the investigation that I didn't understand. And I brought it to the FBI's attention is that uh, the, the, the way that Lockerbie was solved, there was a, a radio that was placed in the luggage of that aircraft. And when that bomb went off, secreted in this radio, it blew parts of the radio out of the plane and they got sucked up by the engine. So when the plane crashed and they went into the engines, the engines act like, the front of the engines act like giant vacuums, right? And so if there was a bomb on a plane and it blew the, a part of the plane out of the plane, there's a possibility that it would get sucked into the engine, right? And that's how they saw a block of it. They started pulling the fans back on the, uh, on the jet engines and within the fans, they found components of the bomb and components of the radio, all right? That's yeah. how they stopped Lockerbie. My question to the FBI was, 
why didn't we pull the engines off the bottom of the ocean floor first and look in the engine fans? Now, I was out there and I'm thinking it's late fall now and the engines uh, finally make their way out to uh, Cavalton and they were put in, they, they weren't even raised on a table. They weren't even, they, these were Pratt Whitney engines, those four of them. And they, they, they didn't even bother putting them on an engine so that you could do an inspection. You had to climb down on the ground and uh, look at these engines. And um, as far as I know, they only pulled back like two fans or three fans and the engines were filled with sand from the bottom of the ocean. Uh, so I didn't understand why there wasn't a more comprehensive examination of the engines to rule out the possibility that there was a bomb on the plane. You know, or, or if Lockerbie, if that's how we solved Lockerbie, I would have thought that we would have paid more attention to the engines earlier to see if they, see if we would get lucky again. There was a theory described to me about the, and this is covering the nature of the explosion, that it's called pedaling. And if I don't explain this right, jumping, because you know more than I do, um, that when there's, in the, the example given to me was that, for example, somebody fires a firearm from inside the house and they, they hit a side of a car, the dent is inward. Whereas if it's fired inside the car, the dent is outward. So this explosion, you know, um, and you kind of covered it, of course, but we'll dive deeper into it now, just to give a clearer understanding to the audience. Uh, pedaling coming into play here when you observed the metal, just for clarification's sake, did, did the explosion seem to reflect outward or did, did, the, did, the, or did the nature of it seem to reflect inward when examining it? Again, it, we, we're only looking at components of the plane. We don't look okay. at, you know, and we, and towards the end, there was, a, there was a large section of the plane missing. There was a, you know, there's a sizable section of the plane that we never recovered, that I've never seen, all right? Okay. Um, what I look for is the shearing and tearing of metal consistent with a high explosive event. And that, that includes like fingering. When you tear metal apart, it will finger and it will comb. It will look like a comb, uh, the edge of a comb. And that's what I was looking for. I was also looking for very small perforations through uh, strong metals, because that would indicate that something was moving at high velocity uh, through that. As far as, uh, a, the overall structure or how they assembled it or, you know, looking at it like that, 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 that really is for aviation experts. And, uh, and I'm not that. So uh, th this, this, you know, there comes a point where um, I imagine some frustration has to set in because you're working hard at this. This is a very exhausting case. It took a long time to get to the concluding aspect of it. When that final report came out in August of 2000, you described being at Calverton, you were there sporadically uh but obviously for a long time you weren't just sitting there twiddling your thumbs as you just described you were digging deep into this from uh 96 up until early of 97 so when do you just kind of i don't want to say reach a breaking point because i don't think that's the right way to word it but when do you just reach a point where it's like jesus christ i'm trying to dig deep i'm trying to get some answers but i feel like i'm getting nowhere you feel like you're stuck in quicksand when does that set in for you well that's a great question uh, uh shortly after february of 20 uh uh, of uh, 1990, uh, 1997, the, the, the last time I went out there was the last time I went out there. And I just basically said, pull me off of that detail. You know, it, 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 it's an investigation that uh, a lot of people sitting around, there wasn't a real sense of urgency on, on, uh, on the part of, uh, of some people to uh, derive the truth or follow investigative leads that I thought should have been followed. So I just asked to be pulled, pulled off of it and, and let somebody else who, who, uh, who might have a better set of eyes than I did uh, take my place and, and, and look at and see if they can uncover something that I might have missed. So that's what I did after, after nearly a dozen times out there and really working, you know, just because you're not there doesn't mean you're not looking at evidence and you're not looking at testimony and that you're not talking to other bomb squad members when they come back. I mean, we had we had almost nightly debriefings on this investigation in the bomb squad. Whoever came back from that day over at Cavalton, I mean, we talked about what they saw and what they did and, and, and where the investigation was going uh, from our perspective. While I was at Cavalton, while I was on the floor, I talked to everybody. 
I talked to the Pilots Association. I talked to the metallurgists. I talked to Boeing engineers, Pratt & Whitney engineers. I talked to uh, people who were responsible for the avionics on the plane. I talked to machinists, mechanics, anybody who, who was uh, helping NTSB trying to figure this thing out. And, and very early in the investigation, I spoke to uh, investigators from England who came over and, you know, we're about a week into, well, I, I can tell you, we were, I was, it had to be like a month into the investigation and they set up a desk there and they had a model of a 747. And as they were bringing components, they would color in the 747. I says, wow, that's a great, that's a great uh, tool. You know, that's a great tool to see because they were working from different debris fields in the ocean. And that, that became very important. Like what part of the plane fell off first? And, you know, the left wing came off and that went over here. And, you know, a lot, a lot of different things happened. And I'm talking to the guy from uh, the British equivalency of the FAA. And I says, what do you think happened? He goes, I think a plane, I think a missile went through the plane and ignited the fuel tank. I think, I think a missile went through the plane and ignited the fuel tank. Right. I said, hey, that makes, you know, because we're, we don't, we're not seeing like big explosive damage. So, we, you know, maybe it was a small missile and uh, it, you know, went through the, uh, the center fuel tank or left fuel tank or whatever, whatever it was. But it, I mean, here's a, here's a guy who's fairly knowledgeable. He doesn't have any uh, uh, reason to lie to me. And that's what he told me. So a couple of things happened after this investigation. And I'd like to share them with you. With Please, you. I want you to share everything that you can. One of the things that happened was the FAA in conjunction with the ATF put together a road show about man pads, man operated uh, anti-aircraft missiles like Stingers, right? And they had a trailer traveling around the country and bomb squads were uh, invited to uh, take a short class on uh, identification of man portable surface to air missiles. They had Soviet ones in there. They had American ones. They had you know Chinese ones, and and so that if we were to find components consistent with these, and they told us like, hey, these are the ranges. This is what it can do. You know, if you have to set up your security corridors, you know, around your airport, this is how you should do it. Blah 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 blah. Now this was after TWA Flight 800. Now why would they do that? Why would they? Why would they say, okay, we're going to have a road show for all the bomb squads in the nation regarding surface to air missiles? All right, but they did. All right, and I attended it. So uh, the other thing is, uh, if uh, let's say it was a surface to air missile, you know, we left a lot of stingers over in Afghanistan uh, with the Mujahideen. And now again, the, the FBI, when I, when I brought that up, they says, well, you know, the batteries only last so long on these Stinger missiles. And it, it uh, you know, it would be impossible for uh, them to, you know, get the batteries. Well, I think a third year engineering student could probably make up a battery for a Stinger missile if he was given a couple of them, you know? So I bet that didn't really hold water for me. Uh, the other thing is like, let's say it was a Stinger missile. What could the government possibly do? I mean, like, what would that do to the aviation industry if it was a Stinger missile? Would you be willing to fly out of Chicago O'Hare or LAX knowing that somebody could be sitting in the neighborhood, you know, a mile away and shoot you, you know, shoot your plane? Or right. even Bradley here in Connecticut. Oh, yeah, exactly. So that that was a big point. And then finally. Uh, the center fuel tank explosion. The uh, 747 is one of the strongest aircraft ever made. It is why we use it for Air Force One. It's what the president flies in, right? If we had a problem with a center fuel tank bilge pump, don't you think they would have grounded the fleet and tore the center fuel tanks out of every 747 and replaced every pump? Notice they, sorry to cut you off, they did that a few years ago when they had a plane crash. I can't remember which flight it was. 
I think an entire airline actually got grounded until they fixed the model of the plane. That was a that was a Boeing seven thirty seven, and that had, that was a computer autopilot problem that centered around training. And uh, the the airline was Norwegian Air. Yes. Their entire fleet were these brand new seven thirty sevens. And Boeing made a great aircraft. Uh, the pilots who were flying the aircraft uh, tried to override the autopilot because they didn't receive the proper training on this particular new autopilot, and they and they they fought the autopilot and crashed the plane, all right? That grounded the entire fleet until the pilots could get re, you know, retrained or they, they corrected this or whatever. But an enti- every 737 got grounded. And it, it, I think it put Nor- Norwegian Airlines out of business. It did. With, the, with this uh, center fuel tank bilge pump, the NTSB or the FAA released a report, I remember reading this, uh, basically saying that when it comes up for scheduled maintenance, you should pay extra attention. And they never said what it was. Was it the insulation on the bilge pump that was bad or was it, was it a, a defect in the manufacturing? Nobody said, you know, what they said was, you know, you have to look, when you, when you pull for this particular maintenance, look carefully at this. Now, I would think that if they really thought that the center fuel tank bilge pump caused an explosion, killing 230 people, they would have grounded all the 747s, they would have crawled into them uh, uh, center fuel tanks, and they would have replaced all the pumps. And they didn't. Uh, they didn't. That, that's not what happened. I don't know what happened, but that's not what happened. And uh, so that, that, that kind of stuck in my investigative mind quite a bit. Um, this was a tough investigation and a lot of hard, a lot of good people worked really hard trying to come to the truth about it. And, uh, uh, the enormity of it was complicated by secrecy and, and, uh, misreporting by the media, uh, which really hindered and hurt the investigation, I, I believe, you know. The great thing about this podcast is that this is a very interesting deep dive into the theory. The bad part about it is that now we're going to die under mysterious circumstances. So in that event, Dan, it's been nice knowing you. Uh, yeah, yeah. So. Well, well, I, you know, I, I, you know, that is something to be concerned about. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. The, uh, uh, this was a, a big investigation. Uh, you had, over 200 witnesses on Long Island say that they saw a missile come up out of the water and hit the plane. You have airline pilots who say that they uh, saw the plane go directly into the water, straight down. But then you have a CIA cartoon uh, yes. that comes out and says, oh, no, what you actually saw was the nose coming off of the plane and uh, fuel on fire as the plane continued to rise up. Now, the pilots who saw the incident said that the plane went straight down. Uh, the radar uh, tracking of the plane say that the plane went straight down. But yet the CIA cartoon says that the plane went up after the, it lost its nose. And listen, you can talk to any aviation engineer and you say, hey, is that possible? And they shake their head. So, uh, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's another thing that makes me wonder about this investigation, you know, this incident. When did they first get involved? The CIA? Yes. Oh, I, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But I, from what I understand, the FBI asked the CIA to uh, come up with a video explaining what the uh, witnesses saw. So basically, it's a video that says, you didn't really see what you thought you saw. What you saw was this. And we make this really nice cartoon to convince you that what you saw was really this. And, and uh, you know, it goes against what everybody saw, including other airline pilots, other pilots, including, uh, you know, uh, Fred Meyer, who saw, saw what he saw. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's a strange case, and it's the first time that 
I ever was involved in a national investigation that I felt that uh, proper investigative procedures that were logical to me uh, were not followed, you know? There's a two minute clip of that very animation you're talking about on YouTube. I would show it. I just don't know if it's going to get me a copyright strike. And I really like my channel, so I, would, I don't want to lose it. But it's for those, I'll link it in the description of this video for those of you that are interested in the uh, in watching it. It's like a two minute long animation showcasing what Dan just described. But I have here some further information and I want to get your comment on this. See if you can add anything. Uh, again, one from the Wikipedia, so it must be true. I'm kidding. Uh, trace amounts of explosive residue were detected on three samples of material from three separate locations of the recovered airplane wreckage described by the FBI as a piece of canvas-like material and two pieces of a floor panel. These samples were submitted to the FBI's laboratory in Washington, D.C., which determined that one sample contained traces of RDX, another nitroglycerin, and the third, a combination of RDX and PETN. These findings received much media attention at the time. In addition, the backs of several damaged passenger seats were observed to have an unknown red brown shaded substance on them. According to the seat manufacturer, the locations and appearance of the substance were consistent with adhesive used in the construction of the seats. And additional laboratory testing by NASA identified the substance as being consistent with adhesives. Now, accelerating ahead, the NTSB, which is running a parallel probe, there's one for, as I explained when Don was on, there was one criminal probe and then there was one. Uh, strictly, you know, air-related probe. The NTSB considered the possibility that the explosive residue was due to contamination from the aircraft's use in 1991, transporting troops the, during the Gulf War, or its use in a dog training explosive detection exercise about one, it was uh, done about one month before the accident. Testing conducted by the FAS Technical Center indicated that residues of the type of explosives found on the wreckage would dissipate completely after two days of immersion in seawater and concluded that it was quite possible that the explosive residue detected was transferred from military ships or ground vehicles or the clothing and boots of military personnel onto the wreckage during or after the recovery operation. It was not present when the aircraft itself crashed into the water. Your comment on that. Okay, so uh, cross-contamination from the uh, National Guard trucks, I, I really don't see how that could be possible. Uh, I don't see how that could be possible. And the... Uh, the uh, National Guard troops that were used to help transport components of the aircraft over to Cavalton, they, uh, I, don't, I don't believe that they worked with explosives. The, 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 really, the, uh, um, it, it, you're, you could find explosives on the firing ranges and with the combat engineers when they do the heavier like demolitions and that kind of stuff. But, in the day-to-day -day operations of the National Guard, National Guard members do not come in contact with explosives. All right, it's that simple. Um, you, if you do it, you're on a range and you're highly supervised. Um, so I just don't see that. Um, I asked, they brought up an Aegis system to detect chemicals and they had it set up at Cavalton. And I asked them, hey, why don't you take a you know, block of C4, put it up against a piece of uh, aircraft component, then stick it in a bucket of salt water for like three days or five days or 10 days, and then run your Aegis system on. And the guy looked at me like I had three heads. Like I shouldn't be suggesting that they test their system, right? So I don't know if any of that was done. I do know that the FBI or somebody participating in this investigation did uh, do explosive tests against air, airplane components. And then that became available later in the investigation to people looking for such things. Uh, uh, it was kind of similar to that Canadian report that I mentioned earlier in uh, the 1970s. So uh, they, uh, there was also an investigator, uh, investigative reporter and his wife who were arrested by the FBI for uh, taking a, a sample of the carpet out and having it examined by a private laboratory. And it came up that it had explosive residue on it. And they were arrested and they were tried. And uh, I, I think it was uh, overturned or something. I think they were convicted, but they didn't have to spend any time. But you know that really sent a shockwave through the uh, reporting community that, hey, uh, if you, uh, you know, 
you go against what they're going to say, you, you might get arrested, you know, and uh, your, your listeners can look that up. You know, this couple that was uh, arrested um, for removing of evidence from the area. Um, I, I think I, I looked at this thing uh, quite a bit. Uh, I looked at a number of reports and testimonies and I think there was explosive residue found on the aircraft. And um, what that means, I don't know. Uh, could mean that it came out of a rocket motor. Could mean that it came out of an explosive warhead. Uh, but as far as the uh, cross-contamination by, uh, by the Army National Guard, I don't see it. Uh, or um, the movement of troops in 1991, using that, that aircraft was chartered in 1991 to move troops. Uh, again, troops don't carry explosives on them. I don't think any aircraft, uh, any uh, airline would permit uh, troops to bring explosives onto their aircraft uh, in, the, in the movement of troops, right? That you would have to do that on military aircraft. Um, and then finally, the dog uh, scenario with the dog training. Um, I've done that a number of times uh, to test and train dogs on detection of explosives. And I would just say that it would be unlikely that there would be enough residue from a dog training exercise left on that aircraft to explain what they found, especially since it was submerged under the ocean. It is more likely to me that what you found was residue from an from a external event, explosive event, a rocket motor, or a, or a warhead, you know? Because now you have, a, you have something, uh, you have explosive residue on the warhead and it's permeating and penetrating uh, parts of the aircraft. If I was to train a dog to smell explosives, I'm not gonna take the explosives and, and take a meat tenderizer and beat it into the seat. You know what I mean? Right. It's, it, it's, I'm just gonna hide it and then I'm gonna pick it up. The transfer explosive elements, uh, I would find that very high, highly unlikely. But that's my personal opinion. Quick pause here on the Mike Damon podcast. We'll be right back with volume 11 of Tales from the Boom Room Profiles, the NYPD's arson explosion and bomb squad. Back here, volume 11, Tales from the Boom Room with my friend Dan McNally, retired NYPD bomb squad detective. Uh, and of course, OSI agent with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. He spent half a lifetime doing the kind of work that would make me crap my pants. So that being said, uh, you know, and I do want to get, go. speaking of the OSI, go back to this for a second. You're on active duty, as you said, you're on military leave, something that you did frequently throughout your time with the bomb squad and, and, and working with OSI. What exactly is an OSI agent in this scenario looking for? Well, we, again, we, we're not an accident investigation, but what we look at, yeah. we do threat assessments for the Air Force. Mm -hmm. So if there is something that happens around the world, say a Stinger missile attack of, a, of an aircraft, uh, we want to know who did it and whether or not they have the capability of doing it again against Air Force personnel or equipment. So believe me, when TWA Flight 800 went down off of New York shores, uh, the entire Air Force community took notice. And uh, I asked a senior OSI member, and he basically told me that we have satellites the US government has satellites that cover from the North Pole to the South Pole and around the world that look specifically for missile launches. This is part of our early warning system against a nuclear attack. And I says, do you think they could pick up a stinger? But at that time, he wasn't really sure that the satellite imagery would be able to pick up a stinger. And I would like to know, like, and of course it would be top secret, at that time, whether or not we had the capability of our satellites detecting uh, a missile launch 
from a man pad from you know out of space. Um, I think it's a possibility. I think uh, that if, if I think I really believe that we're going to get the answers to this investigation uh, sooner or later when people who were involved in it are willing to come forward and say what they know. Uh, and until that happens, uh, you know, it's still going to be a mystery. Uh, some mysteries are there for a reason. And one of the reasons that was brought up by OSI guys who are familiar with how the government works is that we have to protect our aviation assets. And one of the things that we have to protect our aviation assets from American aviation assets, like American Airlines, TWA, Pan Am, whatever, uh, was uh, from fear. If people are afraid of flying, uh, it can destroy our airline capabilities. And we saw that with the uh, coronavirus, right? People weren't flying. Some airlines went out of business. The big ones didn't, but you know, some airlines went out of business. And they definitely took an economic hit. Uh, you know, thank God that people are flying again. But if people are afraid of flying, especially uh, during the tourist season or um, uh, with the uh, Summer Olympics that were supposed to go off like a week later after this incident, there would be a lot of people flying in and out of Atlanta. Um, and if people were afraid to fly, that would, that would be detrimental to the aviation industry in the United States. Um, you might say, why would Boeing uh, agree to this uh, center fuel tank rupture theory. Why would they do that? Well, uh, Boeing get, gets a lot of government contracts. You know, Boeing has a lot of government contracts and, and they particularly did not suffer uh, from this particular incident. So if the, if the blame was laid on them and people remained flying, I mean, that might be a reason why uh, the missile theory was, uh, you know, uh, considered a conspiracy, right? Now I'm just thinking why, what, why would they knock out the missile theory um, when you have so many people who put, said that they saw it? And I think it probably for the good of the uh, aviation industry, keep people flying. Um, it was, it's, uh, if it was a terrorist event, uh, terrorist events, I had one FBI agent say, hey, it's only a terrorist event if we say it's a terrorist event. <laughs> and I said, okay, I got you. And he's right. Like if, 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 if we have a major event and uh, the terrorists want to you know, uh, you know, claim credit for it, but there was some way that we could uh, stop them from taking that credit for it, for it, well, then the public is protected from a form of terrorism, which is fear. So, uh, you know, that's my thoughts on it. 25 years later, it's still a mystery to me. Uh, I wish all my investigations could be linear and, uh, and uh, have a good conclusion. Uh, this one doesn't. I have a lot of questions that uh, are still unanswered. Uh, I feel sorry for a lot of people whose careers were destroyed by this investigation. And I, I definitely feel sorry for the uh, victims and the victims' families of this incident. Uh, because I'm sure they still have questions, you know. I think everybody does. And, and this is something that a uh, former aide to the late President John F. Kennedy said in the November 8th, 1996 edition of the Irish Times, uh, saying, quote, uh, the U.S. Navy, his name is Pierre Solinger. He was 71 at the time. I imagine he's not with us anymore, but he was in 1996. In a telephone interview, he said, quote, it was a terrible accident. The U.S. Navy often carries out missile launching tests. On that day, the TWA plane should have been flying higher. That was what the Navy thought, but the aircraft was flying lower, lower than planned, excuse me, because above it, another plane was beginning a descent to Providence, Rhode Island, end quote. Uh, he said he further adds that, uh, quote, I learned that the file had gotten to the hands of a certain press and it was going to come out in any case. And he accused uh, the media, as you said earlier, of a blackout saying, quote, uh, in this article that he passed it, the information he learned along to an unspecified U.S. television network, which did not broadcast it. So this is like, I don't know if you ever heard the, the song by Depeche Mode, Policy of Truth. Have you ever listened to that song? Uh, I, I might have known it, but I, I don't. Yeah, the, uh, but going back to the Navy theory, um, 
I remember when that was first proposed. And I just don't think that an incident of this magnitude, the sailors on the ship would be able to keep it quiet. I think somebody would have came forward. And because said, the yeah. guilt, the guilt eats you up. Right. If there is any, you know, you can't, I mean, even something as simple as like, I remember when I was a little kid, I was like eight years old. Um, I ate a Hershey bar when I wasn't supposed to. I was supposed to have it later, but when you know, eight, you put an eight-year-old in front of chocolate. I, 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 I confess, I'm guilty. You know, I had the chocolate bar and I would have gotten away with it. If I had, I did a real good job of hiding it. I would have gotten away with it. And this is kind of a silly comparison, but you'll, you'll see where I'm getting at. But the guilt ate me up and I confessed it and I got in trouble, but I couldn't hide it because I felt so awful that I had gone against the rules. And that's with the chocolate bar. OK, that was our Hershey bar. It was delicious. We're talking about a, a major event here that cost 230 people their lives. And if you're talking about, let's just say, and I don't want to say one way or the other, if it did or didn't happen, I respect everyone's opinion on this. And I'm just putting it out there so you, the audience, can hear it and decide for yourselves. Um, but that being said, let's just say that it, that it did happen. You don't get to say, talk about a PR black guy. You don't get to say, whoa, whoopsie, sorry about that, guys. We didn't mean to do that. Back to business. You know, this is this is something that still, I mean, you see the anguish. That's the thing. They just had the coverage of it for the 25th anniversary. And there was a cover of, I don't know if you saw it, the cover of Newsday, one of the relatives of the victims putting his hand on the memorial. Just, you could see the anguish in this man's face. I mean, you never, you've had, and I'm not going to dive deep into it. I, uh, you've had some experience with loss. You've lost some dear friends between the military and the police. You feel that. And these families feel that. And to, to not have the answers um, to that a quarter century later, uh, I don't know how anybody that may or may not be carrying some guilt around can, can look at themselves in the mirror and not come forward and say something. Yeah, I, 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 that's one of the main reasons why I don't think the Navy was involved. Now, listen, the Navy shot down an airline, uh, Iran flight, you know, from an Iranian airliner years earlier, back in the 80s, uh, by accident, you know. Uh, but <laughs> that was over the Persian Gulf. And, I, you know, I, I, that was not off the shores of Long Island. And uh, the, the Navy acknowledged that it was a mistake and that they, they made a terrible mistake with their uh, service day of missiles at that time. Um, I really believe that if a, a Navy ship or Navy personnel accidentally shot down TWA Flight 800, that members of that contingent uh, would have came forward uh, because you can't keep a secret like that. You really can't. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I don't believe that at all. The, uh, so, sorry, go ahead. Let me cut you off. No, no, you say you say that's it. Well, that that that's it. I just don't listen. Americans, uh, like you know, you, you do feel guilt, uh, and uh, you know, people, I, everybody in the military that I know is, you know, fairly ethical, and that if there was an accident, we would try to, you know, come clean with it. Uh, you would hope, you know. Um, yep. So 25 years ago, terrible incident happened, you know, off the shores of New York and a lot of people saw it and, uh, an extensive investigation with probably thousands of different talented people were involved. And what we have to show for that is a cartoon from the CIA. So... <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is a deep dive. If you, if anybody out there, if any of your uh, listening public, uh, you know, want to take a deep dive on this, uh, there's still a number of TWA Flight 800 investigatory groups that are still operating and are still seeking out the truth. And uh, you know, you know, join them and and uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, help them if you can. If anybody sees this and knows something about this investigation or about this incident that uh, they haven't come forward with, uh, you know, please uh, take it to your local law enforcement or the uh, uh, FAA or a reporter or whatever, you know, because the families have a right to know. Of course. Of course. So the last uh, couple of things I want to hit on, and you covered most of it, 
uh, when the Transportation Safety Board released their report in August of 2000, the same guys that investigated it in 96 were still in the bomb squad in 2000. Um, except I think the only new member you guys had in 2000 was Michael Mixon. So besides that, it's still the same crew. And like I said earlier, some guys put, planted their foot firmly in one camp, uh, other guys in the other camp. So was the conversation, you know, was, what was the conversation like uh, in the office of the 6th Precinct that day? Well, it's a, uh, we didn't get a copy of the report, uh, into, you know, until later. And uh, if I remember, the, uh, there was a congressional, like a four and a half hour, five and a half hour of, uh, CNN uh, reading of the report. And, um, you know, it's, it's information overload. You have to have a hard copy of the report in your hand. You have to be able to dissect it and, and look for the parts that you might be familiar with to say, uh, this makes sense, this doesn't make sense. And, um, you know, the bomb squad is a busy squad. We don't have time to do deep dives into uh, history uh, on an investigation that we're on the peripheral of. Um, I, I don't know. It kind of reminds me of like the 9-11 report or like, you know, the, the, uh, the Warren Commission or whatever else, you know, a lot of information, uh, lots and lots of information. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the, uh, that's, a, that's a tough one. Like uh, the, the guys, there were certain guys who worked in the, AV, like uh, Richie Tiesma, he worked in the aviation industry. Uh, uh, he was fairly adamant that airplanes don't blow up. You know, he was, he, he worked around aircraft and I, I got to agree with him. Now, you know, if 747s blew up, they'd all be on the ground. So, um, and then you have other guys who were like, you know, they, they're willing to believe whatever they're told. So, I don't know. I'm a little more skeptical, you know. That's fine. And the last thing we'll hit on is, and I asked Scott, Doc, I don't know if you were present at this lunch, but there was like, you know, it's like four or five months into the investigation. And it's in Don's book too, that a lot of the guys from the bomb squad, I think the only guy that wasn't there, I don't know if you were there, was, was Danny because Danny was out in Bosnia at the time doing what he was doing with the UN, but that the rest of the guys um, in, in, in the squad, you know, this was taking a toll on them. We talked about the emotional toll earlier that they went out to a lunch and they kind of opened up to each other and had a long lunch. Were you, were you a part of that? I, I don't recall the, uh, okay. I, there was a lot of conversations in the office about this investigation because guys would return back to the office and they would be frustrated over what they saw and what they saw and what they didn't see. Uh, and that was a big part of it. Guys were coming back to the office and I took, like I said, I took myself off the investigation. I basically, uh, they, they, I had to be ordered to go out there after a while uh, to, uh, to, to help with this investigation because it, it appeared to me that whatever I had to say um, really didn't matter. And, uh, uh, or whatever I found really didn't matter. So it's better if another guy goes out there who uh, brings a fresh set of eyes. Uh, uh, Richie Tiesma, this, this impacted Richie Tiesma. Jerry Hogue, Sergeant Jerry Hogue, uh, God bless him. He, he, he educated himself as quickly and as, as thoroughly as anybody I've ever seen in any investigation on 747s. He was a walking encyclopedia by the second month of uh, this investigation on 747s. And, and, and we looked at every report. We looked at a lot of reports. When we weren't out of Cavalton, and this was really before the advent of computers being the, what they are today and the internet being the way it is, uh, but we really tried to find every report of accident, aircraft accident, air, aircraft uh, explosion, um, incidences of uh, nose falling off of 747. Um, Lockerbie, we looked at Lockerbie really hard. We were talking to other people too. I mean, while we're in the office, it, it would not be uncommon for somebody to call up the FAA, you know, and say, hey, do you got a report on this? Or do you have that? Or, and, you know, sometimes people would be uh, uh, helpful and sometimes they would just refer us to the FBI, you know, and that, that was that. All right. Well, that 
that concludes what's really been a, a, a very thorough deep dive. And the beauty of it is that you were able to get two different perspectives. Don was great when he came on and go watch those episodes. Those were episodes 86 and 87. It was a two part special. And Dan was great too, because you know, the, the thing about it is that every perspective is different. And even if you had two people there at one time, one person might come away with a different conclusion than the other or a different detail that maybe the other person didn't share. And that's the beauty of it. And so when I decided to take on this project for the listeners out there, as I mentioned, when I had Don on, it wasn't for the purpose of, ooh, we're going to go down the conspiracy theory rabbit hole. No, there's plenty of YouTube videos of people that specialize in that. And you can go watch those. I mean, that's fine to each their own. I don't feel comfortable doing that because we have to operate with delicacy. Obviously, people lost lives and you don't want to be disrespectful. And we weren't. We just covered theories and, and, and factors that can be supported and corroborated by evidence. You know, Dan's not some some uh, loon, you know, sitting with his tinfoil hat somewhere in a tunnel. I mean, the guy the guy was on the ground, boots on the ground in the bomb squad for 17 years. And he was in the OSI and the Air Force for many years of a, of a 29 year military career. So he knows a thing or two about what he's saying, which is why I wanted to have him on. Um, so that being said, uh, I want to thank all the listeners for listening to this. I'll put out, depending on how long this is, I'll see after I edit it. I might be, it might be split into two parts. We'll see, maybe, maybe not. But in any event, I want to thank Dan for coming on again and making the time for me. And I want to thank uh, all of you for listening as always. Anything that you want to say before we conclude, Dan? No, th 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 thanks for the opportunity to get something off my chest. Uh, when we spoke, first spoke about this, I, I went through my files and my logs or whatever I had. And uh, I have to tell you, this is an investigation that kind of sticks with you. And um, it, it's a tough one. It's a really tough one. And again, my, my heart really goes out to the victims and their families because uh, none, none of them people should have died that day. Mine too. And uh, absolutely. So and on the uh, on the plugging end, I'll just put out uh, my information out there. If you want to find me on Twitter, Mike in New Haven. If you want to find me on Instagram, for all the listeners out there, original underscore MC1. Of course, if you want to find me on LinkedIn, where Dan and I are connected, be like Dan and search me up at Mike Cologne, MIC, and Pasha PD and connect with me there so you can see all my musings and post about future episodes of the podcast. Sports Business Line, 917-727-0891. Email for that, Cologne on sports, C-O-L-O-N on sports at gmail.com. Other business line for all other podcast inquiries, 917-781-6189. Ring me up. I'll be happy to talk to you. Or email me at the Cologne Report, T-H-E-C-O-L-O-N Report, uh, gmail.com. Coming up on the Mike Name Podcast next week, the continuation of the miniseries, The Best of the Bravest Interviews with the FDNY's Elite. August 9th, we have Paul Hassagan, who spent 20 of his 25 years in the FDNY in Manhattan's Elite Rescue One. And August 10th, we continue with Features of the Finest, retired NYPD homicide detective Phil Grimaldi, who uh, solved the murder, amongst many murders he solved, of uh, Lewis Miller, a detective who was gunned down in the line of duty in 1987. So on behalf of retired NYPD bomb squad detective and Air Force Special Agent Dan McNally, this has been Volume 11 of Tales from the Boom Room, uh, Profiles of the NYPD's Bomb Squad, and we will see you next time.